Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 11 starts now. The FBI is on the move in Michigan, serving federal subpoenas to those who signed on as false electors for former President Donald Trump. The fake elector plan was attempted in multiple states where the former president lost. The plan was to replace the rightful electors, but of course that plan failed here in Michigan. The fallout goes on tonight. Mara McDonald, live downtown. You talked with one of those who signed her name to the fake elector letter, Mara. Devin, and here's the thing. She says that she thought she was signing an attendance sheet, not signing up to be a false elector. I didn't even know what an elector was, let alone a fake elector. I signed a piece of paper. I know it was blank. So what did Michelle Lundgren think it was she was signing after showing up to a GOP meeting in Lansing and having cake and coffee? I signed nothing but what appeared to be, like I said, a sign-in sheet. It was after the fact that somebody said they probably stapled it to official docs. The FBI showed up at Lundgren's home yesterday. She welcomed the agents in and answered everything they asked. She's been subpoenaed to appear in Washington, D.C., either in person or virtually on July 8th. And while it's likely that all 16 of those fake electors have been subpoenaed, all that we reached out to have not returned calls except Lundgren. Former Michigan GOP state party chair Laura Cox in her deposition for the January 6th committee testified there was a plot to have these fake electors hide in the Capitol overnight so they could cast their votes for Trump the following day. Her reaction to that scheme? I told him in no uncertain terms that that was insane and inappropriate. Back here live, that scheme to stay overnight in the Capitol never materialized. What did happen, those fake electors did try and gain access to the Capitol, but they were rebuffed by the Michigan State Police. Now, Lundgren, for her part, says she is going to comply with that federal grand jury subpoena and that agents spent about two hours at her home today talking to her, going through her computer and her phone. We're live downtown tonight. I'm Mara McDonald. Local four. Well, it goes for her and many others. All right, Mara. All right. Well, meanwhile, in Washington, we're hearing from the three Trump appointed Justice Department officials detailing how the former president wanted to use the department to overturn the 2020 election. The aim of the January 6th committee today was simple. Bring in former Trump Justice Department officials to describe how day after day, former President Trump asked the DOJ to keep him in power and investigate baseless allegations of voter fraud. These allegations simply had no merit. Richard Donahue was a former acting deputy attorney general. In the days before and after the attack on the Capitol, <laughs> Jeff Rosen, Trump's former acting attorney general, said the president asked him to use the department's power to seize voting machines from key battleground states, all to throw the election results into question. Mr. Rosen, the president asked you to seize voting machines from state governments. What was your response to that request? <clears> that we, had, we had seen nothing improper with regard to the voting machines. The former top officials said none of them gave in to Trump's demands, which was essentially to overturn the election. You also noted that Mr. Rosen said to Mr. Trump, quote, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. How, how did the president respond to that, sir? He responded very quickly and said, essentially, uh, that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm just asking you to do is just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. And today's hearing taking place even as the committee gathers new information re requesting footage and deposing a documentary filmmaker who had been working behind the scenes at the Trump White House. The next hearing is set for mid-July. A fire tears through an Auburn Hills townhouse destroying six units. The families who live in those townhouses losing everything. Jason Colthorpe is there tonight with an up close look at the damage. Yeah, guys, let me just give you a look at just how intense this fire was right now. By the way, you can see restoration crews working to put plywood up on the windows, on the doors of these units. They've been putting padlocks on some of the other doors to make sure no one gets in here and just take a look at this vehicle here. This was close to the, where the fire was most intense. Just look at how much that has been melted, those taillights. And if you see the lawn here, you can see just how hot this was and how much this burned. 
The fire broke out about 3.40 this afternoon at a corner unit of the countryside townhouses in Auburn Hills. When the crews got on scene, they found a pretty heavy fire load uh, with the fire working through the roof and working the length of the attic. So it elevated to a second alarm and we brought in uh, mutual aid departments. The fire quickly started spreading along the roof of the six connected townhomes. About an hour after we were on scene, we brought the fire under control. I went around back and I started praying. <laughs> I started praying. I said, put this, put this fire out. Quanell Edwards and his wife and their five kids live in the unit on the opposite end from where the fire started. He was about to wake up to go to work. Instead, he woke to his wife telling him to get out. I came outside and uh, the left side of the complex uh, building was pretty much engulfed in flames. Watching the fire move closer and closer to his home was excruciating until it finally destroyed most of his second floor. My uh, nine year old, he was Oh, he was crying so bad. It was kind of hurt, hard to see, you know, because he thought, you know, we were going to be caught in it and he didn't want to lose us. He didn't want to separate from us, which is, you know, that's how children are. They have insurance and a place to stay, but they, like the other five families, have lost just about everything in here. I'm not worried. I just I just thank God that everybody's safe and uh, we just got to move on from here. The Edwards, by the way, they live on the far end of this building. His nine year old, he said it just celebrated a birthday, had a bunch of toys, and as they were all rushing out, he grabbed a few of those and, and ran out. He said, just bless his heart. But again, everybody, okay. Uh, they don't have a cause yet, but the woman who lived in this unit where it's believed to have started is elderly, suffers from dementia, and they believe that may have had something to do with it. We're in Auburn Hills. Jason Colthorpe, Local 4. That's heartbreaking too. All right, Jason. The trial for the uh, Oxford High School shooting defendant has been pushed back several months. During a virtual hearing today, attorneys for Ethan Crumbly asked for a delay because of the large amount of evidence to sort through. Prosecutors agreed, and the trial has been pushed from September to January of 2023. The judge also ordered that Crumbly will be will continue to be held in the Oakland County Jail. A stretch of I-696 in Farmington Hills back open tonight after a deadly crash that happened this morning. It was in the westbound lanes near the uh, I-275 interchange. State police say a 57-year-old semi-truck driver rear-ended a Buick LaCrosse. That started this chain reaction that involved at least three vehicles. A 72-year-old man, a 69-year-old woman, they were inside the Buick and they were killed instantly. Two other drivers had to be taken to the hospital, though with non-life-threatening injuries. A rally held in downtown Detroit late this afternoon to show support for a very familiar name to Red Wings fans, Vladimir Konstantinov. Yeah, the rally for Vladdy comes as the Wings legend and his family is fighting Michigan's auto insurance reform law, which has reduced services to people living with catastrophic injuries. Among those in attendance, former Stanley Cup winning teammate Darren McCarthy. I'm here for my buddy Vladdy and for his friends and for everybody else affected. At the end of every data point is a human life. And we're literally talking about life and death here. We're talking about quality of life. And the amount of people here exemplify the fact that people care. There is a lawsuit challenging whether the law has, uh, was unconstitutionally applied to drivers injured in a catastrophic crash prior to the law taking effect. An appellate court heard the case earlier this month with a ruling to come in the very near future. Late night in the nation's capital with the Senate passing the bipartisan gun safety bill within the past hour with several Republicans joining Democrats to support the measure. The deal enhances background checks, addresses the so-called boyfriend loophole and provides grants to states to implement red flag laws or crisis prevention programs. The House expected to approve the bill tomorrow, which would mean it would head to the president's desk. Once signed, it would become the most significant federal legislation to address gun violence in several decades.